the next presentation we are going to have is uh, from Yanni. Uh, Yanni is together with uh, uh, with uh, Diana leading uh, the fibrosis group. Yanni has been here for uh, for ten years. She is, uh, I mean, Yanni is a fantastic person. Uh, those of you who know her knows that uh, that she knows a tremendous amount of lung biology, of collagen biology in the lungs. And so I actually don't think we would have any better uh, to discuss uh, collagen uh, and wound healing biology in the lungs than, uh, than, than Yanni. Uh, she's really been pioneering some of, some of the research efforts we have uh, in lung, of course, together with Diana and with the technologies. Uh, and and I, have, I have seen some of the, of the, of course, slides that Yanni has, and she really has a fantastic story to, uh, to, uh, to uh, tell Yanni. Uh, we can't wait to see your data. We see your slides and it looks good. Perfect, thank you. So thank you for that uh, introduction, uh, Morten, that very kind introduction. So I'm, uh, I'm Jenny San. I'm leading the respiratory team at Nordic Bioscience. Uh, and today I will talk about pulmonary fibrosis. So I've been in this field for, for more than 10 years by, na by now. Uh, and when I started out, all the focus was basically on the interstitial matrix and on the main fibrillar collagen, so type 1 and type 3 collagen, and on their formation. And that's, of course, very natural because this disease is a fibrotic disease, so it's a disease of collagen formation. Um, but what we found out in our research over the last 10 years um, is that we should look at also the degradation of interstitial matrix uh, and look beyond the, the more... Um, convenient uh, and normal collagens. So we found that collagen type 6 is very important in pulmonary fibrosis. Um, it's actually been shown that it's one of the most abundant proteins in the lung. Um, and during this talk, I'll also try to convince you that we should look to the basement membrane and also to the wound healing processes when we evaluate pulmonary fibrosis. So why should we even look at pulmonary fibrosis? Because it's a very rare disease, um, but it's also a very progressive disease. So this example here is showing, showing IPF, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, and how the disease uh, can progress over time. So these patients have a very short lifespan from the time of diagnosis. The mean survival is only three years. Um, so they progress really rapidly and it's a very severe disease and more severe than, than many cancer types. So although these patients have um, progressive disease, severe disease, they can still take different routes. So for example, here you have a patient that, that's progressing really rapidly, but you can also have a, a relatively more slow uh, progression. So it's very important and it does really a medical need to identify these patients and figure out which patients will progress the fastest and which ones will not. Um, and by doing that, we can um, cho choose the right um, medication and really do precision medicine in pulmonary fibrosis. So taking a look into to the lung and what actually goes on when you have pulmonary fibrosis. Seen here is, is the distal parts of, of the lung um, where we have the epithelial cells here uh, protecting the lung tissue. Uh, underneath that is the basement membrane here shown in purple. And below that, the interstitial matrix, which, which really makes up the biggest parts of, of the, the lung tissue. But the lung is real, really a bit different uh, from many of the other organs in that sense that the extracellular matrix layer is very thin, especially here in the alveolar spaces, where it's almost only a basement membrane that we see. And that's because we need to, to breathe and we need to transfer gas from the air and to the blood. So what happens when we have pulmonary fibrosis? A lot of things actually happen. Um, so firstly, we have a disruption of the protective epithelial layer, also a disruption of the basement membrane that lies just beneath it. We have a thickening of the interstitial matrix. So the, the fibroblasts are activated and they produce extracellular matrix proteins and especially collagens. So this means that the interstitial matrix layer is thickened and it's getting harder to breathe. Additionally, we have an influx of inflammatory cells, and these cells produce proteases that can degrade the interstitial matrix, the basement membrane tissue. Um, when we have these both formation and degradation 
of proteins in the extracellular matrix, we can have release of protein fragments, so the new epitopes. And we can measure these epitopes as biomarkers of disease. So I'm sure you've seen this, uh, this figure quite a few times by now. Um, but I'll just like to, to highlight this again because it's so important. <clears throat> so we are not just measuring a protein. We are measuring specific parts of a protein that tells different stories. For example, here, the P1MP biomarker that measures a propeptide of type 1 collagen. This is a measure of collagen formation. But when we look into um, degradation biomarkers, so for example, C1M, CTX1, we can have a measure of collagen degradation. So the, the fragments that we can, we can assess, the degradation fragments, also tell different stories. So C1M is produced by MMPs and is a measure of soft tissue degradation. CTX1, on the other hand, is made by catepsin and is a measure of bone resorption. So it's really important to know what we're measuring uh, and what part of the protein we are measuring. So taking a deeper look into to the basement membrane um, and the interstitial matrix and what's really in it. So, so um, as you know, there's a lot of different collagens and they, are, they have different functions and different structures. And we find different kinds in the different parts of the extracellular matrix. So up here, you see an example from the basement membrane. This is type four collagen, which is really the main constituent of the basement membrane. This is a network forming collagen that forms the basis for the epithelial cells to lie on. Then when, if we go down to the interstitial matrix, you can see that the, the structure of the proteins, proteins here are much different. These are fibrillar collagens and they have another function. They, they provide tensile strength to the tissue. So again, just to underline that it's really important that we know what compartment we're looking at and what kind of proteins we're investigating when we look at pulmonary fibrosis. So I'll try to make kind of a, a timeline over pulmonary fibrosis and what happens um, in the lungs. So first we have uh, epithelial cell injury and activation. This leads to profibrotic mediators. And these mediators then have an effect on fibroblasts that proliferate and are activated. And these activated fibroblasts then produce matrix that are deposited in the lung tissue as fibrosis. So I think this, this actually shows that we have effects on three different processes. Um, firstly, the wound healing is affected with the early injury. Next, the basement membrane because it's lying just beneath the epithelial cells. And then lastly, we have the effect on the interstitial matrix and the actual fibrosis formation. So can the new epitopes of the interstitial matrix be used to evaluate pulmonary fibrosis? So that's what we've been looking into for the last 10 years by now. Um, and one of the first studies we did uh, was looking into the profile study in a collaboration with Toby Mahir and Gizit Jenkins and GSK. So we're really fortunate to be able to work with this, uh, this cohort. Um, so this is a really unique cohort, cohort by now because these patients are treatment naive. And today there are two different um, treatments available for these patients. So it's really not possible to get treatment naive patients um, anymore in, in this kind of study. So what we did uh, back then was looking at a subset of patients from the profile cohort. Um, and these data were published in Lancet Respir Respiratory Medicine uh, by Gisley Jenkins. Um, and if you look here at the lung function measurements, uh, force vital capacity is 77.5% of predicted. Um, diffusion capacity is uh, below 50%. So this means that these patients are quite severe and they're also quite progressive. So since this time, we've been, we've been very lucky to, to continue this collaboration. And in the last few years, we've actually been measuring uh, additional biomarkers in the whole uh, profile cohort. So more than 500 patients. And that's the data that I've brought today. Um, so firstly, we looked into collagen formation biomarkers. So of course, collagen formation is the, the thing you would go to first when you evaluate pulmonary fibrosis because it's, it's a fibrotic disease. We measured these biomarkers over time from baseline until 12 months, 12 months, um, and then divided the patients into progressors here shown in blue and non-progressors shown in gray. 
And what we found was that the collagen formation, so formation of both collagen type 3 and collagen type 6, was significantly increased in the patients that progressed in disease as compared to the stable patients. We also looked into collagen degradation. So this was actually very new data at the time, um, showing that collagen degradation is also um, interesting to look at in pulmonary fibrosis. And we see here data from degradation of type 1 collagen, type 3 collagen, and type 6 collagen. And we see again that the progressive patients have significantly higher levels of these biomarkers as compared to the stable patients. So having seen that, we also wanted to see if these biomarkers could actually be modulated by a potential antifibrotic treatment. Um, so we did this study in, in a collaboration with GSK, where we looked at their omepelisib uh, drug that's in development. Uh, so this is a PI3 kinase mTOR inhibitor. Um, and we looked at this in a proof of concept study, a phase 1b study of IPF. So it's, very, it's a very small study. It's uh, only 17 patients, and they were treated for 7 to 10 days. So we have three different arms of omepelisib treatment and one placebo. And even though this study was so short, we saw a very clear effect on the collagen formation biomarkers. So here again, collagen type 3 and collagen type 6. We see that the patients that were treated with placebo, they had increasing levels of collagen formation, whereas the ones that had active treatment, they had significantly and dose-dependent decreases in their collagen formation biomarkers. So this, of course, is a really interesting finding that we can see this effect in such a short time frame. Um, so we wanted to look a bit more into this omepelisib and, and if we could also backtrack and see if it translates to what we can find in preclinical models. So we looked into the scan jar model, which is a model of lung fibroblast. And here we actually see exactly the same picture that with increasing doses of omepelisib, we have decreasing levels of pro -C6. We also looked to the precision cut lung slice model here using human fibrotic lung tissue, and we see exactly the same picture. So this really underlines that some of these biomarkers can be used as translational tools, tools and they can be used throughout drug development. So knowing this and having seen that we have some great biomarkers just looking at the interstitial matrix, then why should we be looking to the basement membrane? And I think we should do that because the basement membrane is the first line of defense. So as I showed you before, it's lying just beneath the epithelial cells. So it really takes the first hits. It's the first, first part of the extracellular matrix that, that's injured um, when you, you have uh, ongoing pulmonary fibrosis. So this paper from Toby Mahir came out in 2017, looking into the epithelial damage in the profile cohort. Here they measured two biomarkers of epithelial damage, SPD and CA199. And they saw here that both these biomarkers were significantly upregulated in the progressive IPF patients. So this really indicates that the early injury to the tissue can be used to evaluate um, progression and be, be a useful biomarker. So we wanted to look into collagen type 4, which is one of the main constituents of the basement membrane. So here we looked at C4M, so degradation of type 4 collagen in the profile cohort. And we saw that the patients that are progressing in disease, shown here in dark blue, they actually have higher levels of uh, collagen type 4 degradation as compared to the stable patients, indicating that we have increased basement membrane degradation in these progressive patients. We also looked into ProC4, which is a measure of a collagen type 4 formation. Um, we did this in the Danish PF bio cohort uh, in a nice collaboration with Sahir Shaker and Nils Heuer. Uh, and these data were produced by my PhD student, uh, Henrik Jessen. Uh, and he very nicely showed that the patients that have progressive IPF, they have significantly higher levels of ProC4, so more basement membrane formation as compared to the stable patients. So going back to this figure, I think that we can add, in addition to the interstitial matrix remodeling, that we should also look at the basement membrane remodeling when we evaluate pulmonary fibrosis. So now I want to shift gear a little bit to, to COPD. So you might think that COPD is a very different disease, and why should I talk about this in a talk about uh, pulmonary fibrosis? 
Um, so COPD is a, is a disease of, of destruction, whereas pulmonary fibrosis is more of a buildup of tissue. Um, but even so, there are really a lot of the same processes going on in the lung tissues of these patients. So in COPD, we have an injury to the lung tissue, which is often caused by cigarette smoke. This activates the epithelial cells, which in turn activate the fibroblast. And these fibroblasts produce collagens that results in fibrosis in the small airways. Cigarette smoke also have an effect on inflammatory cells. So these are activated and they produce proteases that um, degrades the tissue and results in emphysema. So as you can see from this, it's, it's still a matter of building tissue and degrading tissue. It's just the balance that's shifted. So here we have more of degradation as compared to formation. And I would also argue that it's the same three processes that are important in COPD as we think are important in pulmonary fibrosis. So wound healing, basement membrane, and interstitial matrix. So one of the very first studies I did when I did my PhD uh, was looking into acute exacerbations of COPD. Um, so in this study, uh, 69 patients came to the hospital with an acute exacerbation. And then four weeks later, they came into a follow-up uh, visit when they were clinically stable. And we saw that the collagen degradation, so here both type three collagen, type four collagen and type six collagen, so both interstitial matrix and basement membrane, the degradation was signific significantly increased during an acute exacerbation. But when we looked to the formation of these proteins, we saw a different picture. So looking at collagen type three, we actually saw no difference in the formation. Pro C4, we saw that the formation was increased during an exacerbation, whereas the collagen type six formation was decreased during an exacerbation. So this really shows that different processes occurs in different parts of the lung tissue. So it might mean that we have a repair response in the basement membrane, having uh, an increase in the formation of type 4 collagen, whereas we see something completely different with the type 6 collagen. So it's really important to look at the balance between formation and degradation, and also look at specific uh, epitopes and know what you measure, not just measuring a protein. So we've been very lucky also to have a great collaborators in the CBD field. So we've been working on the Eclipse cohort for, for quite many years by now, and we've done this in a collaboration with uh, Johan Vespo and, and GSK. Um, so this is a big study of COPD, an observational study uh, with very well characterized patients. And we assessed almost 1,000 patients and measured our biomarkers in the blood samples and then looked at their, their outcome after three years. So one of the biomarkers that we, we investigated in this study was C4MA3. So actually, I started developing this biomarker when I did my master thesis work uh, many years ago by now. Um, and this biomarker actually quantifies alveolar basement membrane degradation. So it's measuring a fragment of type 4 collagen coming out of the alpha-3 chain. So alpha-3 is, is quite a specialized chain of type 4 collagen, and it's only found in a few locations throughout the body. And one of those are the alveolar basement membrane. So the fragment that we're detecting is generated by MMPs. So we're really detecting MMP-derived um, alveolar basement membrane degradation. So we measured this biomarker in the Eclipse cohort and saw that patients with COPD, they have significantly elevated levels of C4MA3 as compared to smoking controls and non-smoking controls. Additionally, we found that the patients with the highest level, they had a higher risk of mortality. So this really shows that the, both collagen type four and the interstitial matrix is important when we look in, into COPD. So now I wanna backtrace a bit further and look at the first injury. So can the first response to injury be used to evaluate pulmonary fibrosis? Mm -hmm. And to look at that, I just wanna go very briefly over uh, what happens in, in the early wound healing. So when you have an injury in the lung tissue or in any tissue, you have platelets coming in and these platelets, they release fibrinogen. Fibrinogen is then um, cleaved to form fibrin and fibrin forms the blood clot. And when this clot is, is done working, the clot is uh, resolved 
and fibrin is degraded and we have fibrinolysis. So we've used this um, in, in with, with our technology, we've made a biomarker that can assess this process. So it really assess uh, the resolution, clot resolution of fibrinolysis. So this biomarker is uh, XFIP and it measures a fragment of fibrin that's cross-linked and then degraded by a plasmin. So it's really a, a measure of um, a, a final clot, uh, a clot that has been cross-linked and a degradation of that, so clot resolution. And we looked into this biomarker in the Eclipse cohort and found again that this was actually significantly elevated in patients with COPD as compared to controls. We also saw that the patients that had high levels, they had um, significantly higher risk of mortality. So now we've seen that two different processes, though both the fibrinolysis and the basement membrane degradation are related to mortality in COPD. So although these are connected, um, we think it's, it's very different processes. So we wanted to try and combine them and see if we could actually improve the prediction of mortality. So these graphs here show in the dotted line, the patients that had low levels of both biomarkers. In gray, the patients that had high levels of one of the biomarkers. And in, uh, in black, the patients that had high levels of both biomarkers. And what we can see here is that when, when we combine these two biomarkers, we actually get a better prediction of mortality. So it's worse to have uh, both biomarkers upregulated. So an effect on both fibrinolysis and uh, basement membrane degradation. So fibrinolysis seems to be also really important in, in pulmonary fibrosis and in IPF. So currently we're looking into the, the XFIP biomarker in the profile cohort as well. And these, the, these data and these analysis are still ongoing, um, but I can share with you this, this uh, initial graph showing that the progressive patients have significantly higher levels of XFIP than the stable patients. So I think these data are really encouraging and, and indicate that we really should be looking more into the wound healing process when we look at IPF. So I would like to go back to this figure now um, and add uh, on top of the interstitial matrix and the basement membrane remodeling, then adding the wound healing to the picture because it seems that it's, it's, it's important and it can tell a different story and an important story to look at also the wound healing and not just the extracellular matrix. So talking about uh, lungs in, in, in the times we're living in now, it's, it's almost impossible not to mention uh, COVID-19. Uh, so I'll just do that very briefly. Um, so patients with COVID-19 actually have a lot in common with, with pulmonary fibrosis. So they have uh, huge effects on their wound healing. So an example is shown here um, where you can see there's microthrombi uh, shown here by the arrows in the alveolar capillaries. And there's also a deposit of fibrin in the, uh, in the alveolar spaces. The more severe cases of COVID-19 um, can show with pulmonary fibrosis, which is indicated here. Um, and for now, we really don't know how, how long this fibrosis will last, if it's, uh, it can resolve over time, or if it will be a, a longer lasting um, uh, effect we will see of the fibrosis. So we, we see here that there are many common features with pulmonary fibrosis, and we think that we can use the, the knowledge that we have um, to look into COVID-19. And we've actually written this, uh, this review uh, on the matter, uh, looking at uh, discussing whether biomarkers of extracellular matrix remodeling and wound healing can be used to identify the high-risk patients. So if you're interested in that, I would uh, encourage you to go and, and read this. So for the, for the last part of my talk, I will talk a bit about treatment and if the collagen remodeling can actually be modulated by treatment in pulmonary fibrosis. And to do that, I'll, I'll look to, to LPA. Um, so LPA is, is produced when, when the lung is injured and LPA activates receptors, LPA1 receptors on the fibroblasts. And this makes the fibroblast produce excessive amounts of collagens that then will re uh, result in fibrosis. So BMS has, uh, has developed a, a compound that targets the LPA1 receptor, BMS 
986020 um, and tested this in a phase 2b trial of IPF. And we have investigated our biomarkers in this trial. Um, so they included 143 patients with IPF um, and treated them with placebo or two different doses of uh, GLP-1 receptor antagonist for 26 weeks. And we measured biomarkers of interstitial collagen degradation and also um, degradation and formation of the basement membrane. And we found that all these biomarkers were significantly decreased by active treatment. So the placebo arm here shown in blue are stable or actually even increasing, whereas the active treatment arms, they are significantly decreased already after four, four weeks of treatment. So we thought this was really interesting, a really interesting finding to see that this LPA pathways seems to be so relevant in pulmonary fibrosis. So we wanted to look more into um, what happens with the fibroblasts. So we, we did the, the scan a jar uh, model, so a fibroblast model. Usually we stimulate the cells with TGF beta uh, to activate them and produce collagens. But in this case, we tried to stimulate them with LPA uh, in order to see if, if LPA was actually fibrogenic in this setting. And then of course, also look at the receptor uh, antagonist and see if we can see any effect on the collagen formation. So first of all, we saw that when we stimulated cells with LPA, we had significantly higher levels of collagen formation here shown by the ProC6 biomarker. And then when we added the, the antagonist, we saw that pro C6 levels were significantly and dose dependently decreased um, by the compound. So this really indicates that we can have an effect on collagen biomarkers, even though the, the compound in question is not targeting collagens as such, it's targeting LPA, but we see an effect on the collagen biomarkers. So to summarize uh, my talk, uh, pulmonary fibrosis is characterized by remodeling of the interstitial matrix, remodeling of the basement membrane, and also changes to the wound healing process. And these changes we can quantify by our new epitope biomarkers. And these biomarkers have shown to be related to disease progression and also mortality. And we have also seen that they can be modified by antifibrotic treatments. So before I end, I'd like to, to thank all the people that have been involved uh, with this work. So our collaborators around the world who have provided these very precious uh, samples so we could study the, the extracellular matrix in patients. Um, and also, of course, my team at, at Nordic Bioscience and other colleagues at Nordic Bioscience who've been involved in this work. And then I'd like to leave you on, on this slide. And I hope I've been able to convince you, or at least some of you, that you should not just look at the interstitial matrix when looking at pulmonary fibrosis, but also look to the basement membrane and the wound healing. So thank you. <laughs>